I welcome you all, and I in particular welcome all our speakers, but also participants coming in to this uh, joint uh, webinar with the ACE and IAU. The role of university uh, higher education institutions to provide knowledge and competence for a democratic and sustainable development locally, but also with a global responsibility is widely voiced, but also questioned. And during the last years, and not at least in response to the still ongoing pandemic, the awareness and recognition of the value and importance of cooperation within higher education institutions and association has increased. To jointly take actions in promoting and advocating for higher education research and education and also education at large, for higher education to be recognized and valued as a public good and with a key role in a democratic and sustainable uh, societal future. Also to jointly take actions to increase the understanding of the relevance and necessity of the fundamental principles of higher education for them to fulfill its unique societal role. And fundamental principles including academic freedom, access and equality, inclusiveness, and again, higher education as a public good. Associations, in addition to their role to support its members and their concerns, has unique and special roles in the higher education sectors, and that is to be policy influencers. And cooperation and joint actions among associations actually will strengthen the voices to promote and advocate for higher education on the national and the regional and the international level and also to voice to societies at large, and I would say again, uh, most important to governments and policymakers. So I will give a short view on uh, the activities of IAU in cooperation. I host the global meeting of association previously once a year, but now going online, we have it on a regular basis. And in the context of the uh, global meeting of associations, we develop joint actions, and that is, as examples, the global survey on the impact of COVID, where member associations has been involved in the development of the questionnaire, and also associations to be invited to, pro to provide regional perspectives of the global survey. And another uh, joint action is the joint statement for the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference 2022. I you also have the uh, uh, associations to, on the board as members, and I will uh, tell you right now that there is an election this year, again in Dublin at the meeting, and there is an association from each uh, continent. And also we invite the, uh, the associations to shape the annual and general conferences. And of course, associations are invited to contribute to publications, what they do from uh, the IAU. So with these introductory words, I would like to welcome our speakers and representing different types of associations and regions. So our first speaker at this uh, meeting is the Professor Oluzuli Oyewole, the Secretary General of the Association of African Universities. He has worked in national, regional, and continental organization and has experience in coordinating multinational research and development programs. He has a track record and experience in international and intergovernmental re relations, advocacy, and lobbying for research and research funding. And over the years, he has developed interest in the development of higher education in Africa, including areas, quality assurance, leadership and management in African higher education system. So welcome, Professor Oyewole. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Permit me to share my screen in making this contribution on the roles of university associations. I'm going to start by giving an historic brief on the Association of African Universities that was inaugurated in Rabat, Morocco in November 12, 1967. AAU was established at a time when many countries of Africa were coming out of colonialism. 
and it was found that for them to be relevant to the continent and to the nation, it was necessary for universities to come together and collaborate. Several major objectives were set for the establishment of the Association of African Universities. Number one, to promote interchange, contact and cooperation among university institutions in Africa. Number two, to collect, classify, disseminate and disseminate information on higher education and research, particularly as they relate to Africa. And number three, to promote cooperation among African institutions in curriculum development and in the determination of equivalence of degrees. Beyond this, AU was established to encourage increased contacts among member institutions and the international academic community. It is the expectation that AU will study and make known to the educational community issues about African higher education institutions and, could, and ensure coordination among them in their operations. It's also quite interesting to note that AAU was set up to encourage the development of the use of African languages in African institutions. And lastly, AAU has been set up to organize, encourage, and support semi organization of seminars and conferences between universe, African university teachers, administrators, and others dealing with higher education in Africa. Looking at these objectives that have been set for AU, one would now ask what are the roles of university associations? The first thing I want to put up is that universities association, they are supposed to serve as champions of higher education in their areas of responsibilities and indeed in the world. For example, the AU is the African Union uh, Implementation Agency on higher education. And we coordinate the continental education strategy for Africa on higher, in higher education clusters. As of today, AU also advocates for African higher education and maintains relationship with regional bodies such as uh, ECOWAS, IUCA, UNESCO, among others. So university associations are supposed to serve as champions of higher education, not just in their continent, in their own area, but indeed in the, in the whole world. Number two, university associations serve as platforms for cooperation. If I will talk about AAU, we believe that regional and international collaboration is central to African development aspirations. And through our biennial and our high level conferences and events, the Association of African Universities bring together university leaders and other higher education stakeholders around the world. And through this, we promote collaboration and knowledge sharing. The third role that I see university association playing is that of setting intellectual agenda. That is an important responsibility that university association needs to play. For example, in AU, we set intellectual agenda on African higher education landscape that interrogates issues that underpin the continent socioeconomic development. Setting intellectual agenda and knowledge sharing by generating credible evidence as basis for providing reliable advice on policies and practices on higher education in Africa. Very important role that we also play as university association is that of empowerment and capacity building. For example, in the AU, we are committed, we are committed to helping higher education institutions to meet up with the challenges of the time. As I've been mentioned earlier, AU has been helping institutions in their capacity building. We've been associated with issues about leadership and management, quality assurance digitalization and ICT, massification, staff retention, diaspora connection, among others. We are also committed to serving as advocates in the continent. AU advocates for higher education that promotes freedom, for that guarantees freedom for teachers, the students, and for them to have the freedom to search for knowledge and to do their research. AU advocates for higher education for the development of Africa. Indeed, we see 
education as a very important tool that we need for the development of the continent. Another very important uh, responsibility of university association, which I believe not AU alone, but also other university associations are committed to, is that of policy development and policy inf influencing. For example, AU has been involved in continental policy development on issue about credit, African credit, harmonization, qualification frameworks, quality rating mechanisms in Africa. These are continental issues that are that needs to cut across institutions in the whole of Africa. We are not just happy with policy development in the continent, we also encourage institutions to develop relevant uh, policies for their own development. For example, we've helped institutions to develop ICT policies, gender policies, HIV AIDS policies, staff retention policies, among others. In concluding my presentation now, I think that there is need for university associations to collaborate together because when you look at our roles, we appear to, to be having common issues, common issues that we address in our various domains. International collaboration is very important for all of us as we set up intellectual agenda for higher education in our domain. We should continue to be platform for collaboration, not just for our own institutions, for institutions in our own domain to collaborate with institutions in other areas. And for sure, we should be champions of higher education in the whole of the continent. I will conclude by saying that higher education is very important, is very central to our development. And association, university associations have important roles to play. This is in line with the word of Nelson Mandela, who said, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. And if there's a vehicle or organizations that, have been, that can be set up to help in making this to be, I think university associations have important roles to play. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this presentation and also very important words of what uh, associations and the higher educations uh, they work for. Uh, we will come back with um, questions and I will ask some questions to all of you. So uh, we continue with the speakers and then I come back with the questions. And now I ask, is uh, Ted Mitchell there? Yeah, I will today. then shortly introduce you and they can give your, all your presentation. So you have a long and broad experience. You are the president of the American Council of Education, Ted Mitchell. And you have a long experience in the higher education, and you have been professor, dean, college president, trustee, and more recently also the U.S. Uh, Undersecretary of Education in the Obama administrations. And interesting, you have been uh, have a deep experience also in the K-12 education, education at primary and secondary school. And uh, you have served in that perspectives in different uh, organizations. And uh, I think that this is a very important uh, issue. And that is that higher education is part of the whole uh, education ecosystem. So we are very eager to hear what you have to say. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you again so much. Uh, and apologies for uh, having some difficulty getting on. So um, I, I know that we're going to move in a, in a few minutes to a conversation and some questions. And I look forward to that. But a brief background on the on the American Council on Education. We were founded at the at the end of um, the First World War by the American government, and uh, the American government asked us to do three things. One was to connect higher education institutions uh, together uh, to help serve in the rebuilding of a, a war torn world, uh, to uh, build bridges of research and program development, international exchanges uh, that would help. Uh, unite uh, unite the world. And obviously, one of the things that we face today is, uh, although not exactly a, a World War I experience, um, that same need uh, to bring our countries, our communities, our students, uh, and our faculty together. Uh, the second thing we were asked to do was to uh, make uh, higher education more accessible to the young men and women who had served in our armed forces. Many of them uh, left uh, school. Uh, uh, elementary or secondary school and went right into the armed forces. 
uh, without the opportunity for a college degree. And some, in fact, uh, didn't even get a, a secondary uh, degree. And so we've been working uh, for a very long time to create opportunities for not just veterans, but um, low-income, first-generation, uh, underrepresented students of, of all kinds in American uh, colleges and universities. And then the third thing uh, that, they, that they asked us to do was to work closely with the US federal government to develop policies and programs that would help assist in the development of a robust higher education system that served all students, all communities, all states, and that provided the bulwark for a healthy economy uh, and uh, for a, a healthy democratic society. So as you can see, our charter <clears throat> was one that gave us a lot of room. Uh, it certainly has a, a great historical meaning for us at ACE as we do our work. And it has terrific importance to us now as we look at the challenges ahead, which is our task today. So step forward to today. And um, uh, the American Council on Education is the organizing body for all of American higher education. <coughs> Excuse me. Our membership includes all types of colleges and universities in the US, two-year community colleges, technical colleges, four-year liberal arts institutions, major research universities. <laughs> it includes both public and private institutions. And in the US context, colleges that were set up particularly to educate uh, the sons and daughters of slaves, the historically black colleges and universities, and tribal institutions that are meant to uh, be the educational ladder uh, for our uh, first peoples in, in the US. Most of our members are US institutions, also organizations such as accrediting bodies. And we have some US uh, non-US um, institutions among our members as well, providing an important link on a daily basis for our, for our work. Our member, uh, our member individuals typically are the heads of institutions, the presidents and the chancellors. And our programs increasingly not only focus on those individuals, but understand the importance of teamwork in building and sustaining programs that uh, meet the needs of an institution, a community, and in our nation. So we've been working more and more with integrated teams from our institutions. We'll talk more about that, more about that later. And while ACE is not a part of the federal government, and that's sometimes a, a bit of confusion for some of our international counterparts. Uh, and we do not have a direct voice in the development of policy. We pay a great deal of attention uh, to the policies and practices of our federal government. Uh, I meet regularly with the Secretary of Education uh, in, the, um, in the Biden administration. Um, I have uh, long, not only I, but many of us in, the, in, in ACE have long and deep relationships with not only the Education Department, but um, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, other organizations around uh, the government uh, that create policies that impact us. So we have uh, our eyes focused on federal policy uh, and uh, we look for ways to improve our institutions through uh, judicious uh, policy, uh, policy making. The um, underpinning of what we do, and I'll stop here in just a moment, uh, but the underpinning of what we do really goes back to those early years of the American Council on Education, where we were charged with really bringing the higher education sector into contact, productive contact, with the major challenges facing not only the US, but the world. And that continues to be our major focus, is connecting the universities in the United States with the grand challenges that we face, that all of you face, and that our world faces. We'll talk about that as well. And among those, and really standing out for us uh, front and center over the last decade have been the principles of diversity, uh, the breadth of institutional missions and purposes in the US. So we will continue to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, building the most accessible system of higher education in the world, uh, aimed at uh, exploiting individual opportunity, building individual strengths, but more than that, building a sense of collective responsibility for the long-term goals of the United States and the world. It's a pleasure to be a part of this organization. It's a pleasure to be with so many great colleagues today because it really is only through working together that we will be able to achieve the goals for our institutions and for the broader good. Thanks.
Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, then I will go to the third speaker, uh, Professor René Barata Zickman, uh, Director of the Brazilian Association of International Education. You have served as Director General for International Affairs as Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo and Vice President of the Franco-Brazilian Center of Technical and Scientific Documentation. You have been involved in a variety of programs and projects in the field of internationalization. For example, Brazilian internationalization strategy. And you have also been the author for many books and articles in the internationalization theme. So welcome, Renee. Hello, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, the um, uh, ACE and IAU for inviting me uh, on behalf of Albay. And uh, I just start by uh, providing you a very quick uh, overview about uh, Falbai. And um, created in 1988, 34 years ago, uh, the Brazilian Association for International Education, Falbai, is the oldest and most important organization, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the internationalization of higher education in Latin America, and also one of the oldest in the world. Uh, Falbai was created, for example, in the same year as the European Association for International Education, EAIE. Uh, we have more than 200 members, mostly uh, Brazilian higher education institutions, and uh, is the largest network in this area in Latin America. Uh, the main mission is to act uh, to the expansion and improvement of the internationalization process of Brazilian higher education institutions. FALBAI represents, uh, I would say, the voice, the voice of Brazil um, in the, the context of international education worldwide. Uh, our members are both public and uh, private, all types of institutions, universities, small faculties, uh, in the very important cities in Brazil, in the countryside, uh, representing the diversity of the Brazilian higher education systems in terms of nature, type, and region of the country. Uh, from the biggest, the really very biggest uh, research-oriented universities to small higher education institutions in countryside. Uh, FOBI members are represented at FOBI uh, by the international officers or provosts, vice presidents for uh, international affairs. Uh, in its more than 30 years, FOBI has collaborated directly in the training of Brazilian higher education staff, institution staff involved in internationalization. One of the primary focus areas of OBI is enhancing opportunities for international cooperation for our members and disseminating the Brazilian education abroad through partnerships and events, even in Brazil and um, all over the world. Uh, FOBAI is an important player in internationalization of higher education, participating in the main international forums and events in the area in constant dialogue with the main similar association in the world. And this is very, very important for FOBAI, for our associations and for higher education as well, for sure. Uh, FOBAI has an important role in an agenda uh, supposed to have uh, of international education worldwide with a Brazilian vocation, a Latin American perspective, and a global vision. Uh, FOBI promotes uh, capacity building programs. Uh, with the pandemic, we have to uh, reinvent the association as uh, all of us uh, <laughs> have done, uh, providing programs, uh, webinars, workshops, uh, reports, studies, assessments, projects, and events. And every year, um, one of the our most important events are is our uh, annual conference. Uh, and uh, I, I am very happy to announce and to invite you all to our next conference, the Fall by 2022 uh, conference in Sao Paulo City, supposed to be in person. 
uh, on April uh, 25 to 27th um, next April, and we will be more than happy to welcome you all in Sao Paulo. I <laughs> So thank you very much. And I think that we can uh, we will explore more about the internationalization. I mean, there is a lot of challenges on internationalization uh, even before the pandemic, but in particular after the pandemic or during. So our fourth speaker is the director of the Mediterranean Universities Union, Marcelo Scalisi. I welcome you. And uh, you have been the director since 2008. And, uh, but working with the association already since 1998. Uh, uh, he has actually engaged in the coordination of UNIMED's European, international and national projects and initiatives. He gained extensive experience in Sicily in the sustainable tourism sector, managing and monitoring EU projects for local tourism development and providing vocational training for dozens of companies and thousands. And I think that vocational training is also an issue for the future of higher cases. So welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you very much, uh, 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 the International Association of University and ACE for the invitation and for this opportunity to share with you what, uh, what we do and uh, our association and in some way to, to reflect on the role of our association, university associations. Uh, we are in a particular, very diverse situation if we look at the other association already presented today because we join in our network universities coming from two different regions of our world or our side, I mean the European side and the Middle East and North Africa. At the moment, uh, UNIMED has uh, 140 universities from 23 countries. We have universities from all Southern Mediterranean countries, Middle East and North Africa, from Morocco to Syria. We have universities from the European and Mediterranean countries, and also from Western Balkan, from the Gulf, from Iraq, particular also. And from Northern Europe, from Finland, which is very Mediterranean, if I may, uh, because they are very active in this Mediterranean cooperation framework. We started in 1991 in a period very diverse if we look at the Mediterranean uh, history. At that time, there was hope, some hope about the Mediterranean challenges and difficulties, in particular looking at the Palestinian in the Israel conflict. Now, after 30 years, I think that we are in a worse situation in some way. Because we have more conflict in the region, unfortunately, more instability. And the impact of COVID was, is, is still very, very relevant. Uh, but UNIMED once started was a small group of universities at the time, 20, 25 universities. And then year by year, thanks to the activity that we do, the projects that we manage and the networking dimension we go year after year. And now, as I said, we have more than 100 uh, universities and very active with us. We have around 40 projects running, financed, most of them about the European Commission through the neighbor policy. Um, we have also several sub networks that are a small group of uh, universities interested to work together on our common priorities, because this is also another important element for our network to try to show to our uh, communities that it's possible to talk about Mediterranean, not only looking at the intercultural dialogue or political issues, but also to go uh, in, in a very precise way on particular common priorities that we have. Migration, uh, climate change, uh, food and water, um, critical infrastructure, but also mobility of students, which is another important challenge in our in our region. Uh, and a few words about our network is uh, that most important thing that I would like to mention is that we are independent. We are not financed by any government, not by the European Commission for the reason that we exist all the three projects. And we are financed by other universities. And this is very also important to underline that universities, independently where are they from, they pay the same amount of money. This is also the way to encourage independence of our membership and to be in this, at the same, 
in the same uh, ownership once they talk about about Unimo. We have uh, with a large network and then talking about projects, activities, and our interest that we work on a different of thematic issues. But if I if I have underlined something that are very relevant for us is, for instance. Refugees, which is uh, an important priority that we come after the Syrian crisis, very, very relevant. Again, digitalization, independently by COVID, I have to say, but obviously during COVID, this become more and more important. But looking at our region in particular, I have to say that academic freedom and university autonomy remain, still remain one of the key issues for southern Mediterranean countries, for Middle East. Uh, and North Africa. But again, another important element for our network, for our activity is mobility. Uh, through mobility, we could create this uh, sort of Mediterranean generation. Youth able to understand each other in this particular region, you know, uh, on many problems we faced before COVID-19, looking at the terrorism attacks and also the mindset, both sides, the Mediterranean and European side, about the other. And through mobility, we can create the condition to, uh, to pass this uh, uh, prejudice that we are facing in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this region. Uh, obviously, considering the, the problem that we are facing, uh, our role is in some way quite complicated at the moment. We will discuss it later. But uh, if I may, I would like also to underline that it's extremely important that association like our association and others try to share what they do and also try to to put uh, together common issue to be to be to be solved and i think that Mediterranean, in particular the arab society they surely need to, to be inside this international dimension more and more than before thank you thank you very much <laughs> and uh we are all bringing up the issues of uh, being established uh, at a time where there has been war and crisis and we are still facing crisis more than ever so i think we will come back to that and i will just give a short uh, view of the uh, scope of the iau and iau was actually established after the second world war uh, later than the first world war as ted was saying and it was actually on the initiative of UNESCO and the leadership of universities as they saw the threats to higher education after the Second World War. And it was the need of a global voice to, to uh, voice the need of higher education. And uh, I would like to quote uh, the, um, when it was inaugurated, and that was to provide a center of cooperation at the international level among universities and similar institutions of higher education of all countries, as well as among organizations in the field of higher education generally, and to be an advocate for their concerns. And that's what we are going to continue to discuss. IAU is also an independent non-governmental membership organization, depending as what you were saying, uh, membership fees uh, for running the organization. It is an official partner to UNESCO and also based at the UNESCO headquarters. Uh, the members, uh, more than 600, are from different parts of the world and, and actually representing all continents. And we also partners with uh, several uh, intergovernmental organizations. And I would like to, to read off the vision of the IAU because it's, I think it's a ground for our discussion. And the vision of IAU is aims to be the most representative and influential global association of diverse higher education institutions and their organizations, promoting and advancing a dynamic uh, leadership role for higher education. And in the mission, it is to promote and, and uh, collaborate uh, with the members, but also, as I will highlight, and that is the, to really pursue the fundamental values as it was uh, raising the academic freedom, the values that we higher education has to pursue their, uh, their role in societies. There is a specific, specific uh, emphasis on values, leaderships, and also that we are uh, uh, acting as a forum for sharing and joint actions. So uh, our priorities areas, uh, which, uh, which are interconnected, of course, and that is leadership, internationalization, 
sustainable development and also technology development, which has been raised very much in, uh, during the pandemic period. So in short, we work through sharing and developing, uh, developing expertise, peer-to-peer -peer learning, perform trend analysis and provide publications and special, uh, specialized portals. And there is a lot to, to, to get in information on so all these publications on the websites. The pandemic uh, where, where we made a survey or the second is coming out now has highlighted really the shortages in higher education inequality between regions and also within nations in capacity, infrastructure, inequalities, access, of course, and also uh, in the both in the research and, and educations. And I would like to, to, to raise also the gender inequality, which has really been highlighted during the pandemic. So I think that for our discussion there, the uh, shortcomings are also guiding us for how to work and how to cooperate for the future to meet those shortcomings and also to improve higher education for the future. Uh, sustainable development has and this SDGs has been raised and we have a responsibility and IAU has been engaged since the 1990s in the uh, sustainable higher education for sustainable development. And I would just like to mention that um, in response to the agenda 2030, IAU established a global cluster on universities on higher education for sustainable development. You can also look at that at the homepage and uh, with the aim also to gather universities and, and work which is being done in the uh, sustainable development goals and also to be a voice for what is happening around the world. And IU has participated in the high level political forum when it comes to the, the uh, sustainable development goals. So finally, I would just go back and say that cooperation and cohesion uh, with respect and understanding of diversity, and that is includes social, economic, ecological, and cultural conditions between higher education institutions and association. This is needed to promote and advocate for the key role of higher education, as we have raised all of you. And again, association has a specific role as uh, policy influencers on different levels and uh, together we can act globally. And IAU will continue to provide the global platform. And of course, its strength as the global voice will depend on cooperation with uh, institutions and associations all around the world. And therefore meetings like this is very important. So thereby, I would like to, to start uh, the questions, which you have already taken part of. But let's uh, start with the, uh, what do you see? And I go to one by one. And the, what do you see as the primary challenges that your members in your uh, organizations, associations face at the institutional level? We can go back to the grand challenge and the, the um, outside challenges, but what do you see within your institutions? And has the, uh, the uh, challenges changed by the pandemic or during, and also changed the direction for the future? I mean, uh, showing opportunities uh, for the future due to this. So maybe uh, you have already raised your hands easily. So please. I would say that, at the institutional levels, we find out that our institutions are still facing challenges of ensuring quality. They are currently being, I mean, challenged with the issue of aging academics and aging researchers. Massification appears to be common in many of the institutions. And I believe that if I've put this question to institutional leaders, they probably may not put all this as number one. The first thing they would put as number one is funding. Funding is still a major challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, funding is, an, is, a, is crucial. And it was before the pandemic also. And, and, and to run the universities, we need funding. So Ted, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you. Uh, 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 certainly ditto. Um, 
on all of those issues. In addition, I think one of the, the issues that the that our institutions face is a continuing issue uh, on um, uh, the topic of equity. We have for about 30 years worked very hard to create better access uh, in our institutions for low-income first-generation uh, students of color. Uh, we have inched up in terms of the percentage of those students in our student bodies. But the pandemic has really threatened that. Uh, there has been a decrease in enrollment, in an application, and particularly among those students who um, we've been so uh, uh, focused on uh, from under-resourced backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So we're quite concerned at the institution level that we're going to lose a generation's worth of progress on access. And at the same time, we continue to be concerned that even when those students have access, they're really not involved in an equitable education system. And so diversity, equity, inclusion, making sure that all students feel like they're a part of the enterprise remain core issues for us. And they've been exacerbated by the pandemic. And also that uh, connects to the funding that uh, very little That's funding uh, from the public side for education. That's right. We, uh, the um, uh, 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 It's sort of too far in the weeds, but the president has proposed a major increase in federal subsidies for low income students, uh, but that has yet to pass through the Congress. And so we're as we move into this uh, next phase, this next half of the school year, um, our under resourced students remain just that under resourced. Renée, I give you the floor. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, representing Faubai, uh, my approach will be more related to internationalization of higher education, for sure. Uh, uh, as uh, Pan and uh, Ted uh, have already mentioned, one of the biggest challenges is to provide diversity, inclusion, equity, uh, to access to higher education and, and as well, internationalization for all. This is very, very important uh, for FALBAI and for, I, I suppose, uh, all uh, our association. In uh, some regions of the world, including Latin America and Brazil, for sure, access to technology, devices, internet, uh, things sometimes simple as that have been a very, very important uh, challenge uh, for uh, many, many higher education institutions and uh, their students. Uh, we have to support and to fund uh, higher education and especially internationalization of higher education and um, taking into account the inequality of chances. This is very, very important. And uh, the pandemic brought new challenges for sure, uh, but as well uh, also offered important opportunities. And this is uh, important to, uh, uh, to emphasize as well in terms of scientific cooperation, technology and uh, innovation between higher education from different parts of the world, uh, including to face uh, the COVID. Uh, and find uh, new ways of collaboration in education at a global level. And uh, I would like to briefly mention two recent projects, uh, for by projects, uh, the BRAVE, the Brazilian Virtual Exchange Program. I have no time to, to explain, but you can find more information about this important program in our website. And also um, the uh, INILAT, um, initiative, Latin American Initiative for the Internationalization of Higher Education in the context of uh, pandemic, uh, together with uh, six other countries and association, we have created this initiative. Um, associations from uh, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. And uh, the initiative for sure is open to articulations and synergies with other initiatives and networks, uh, even in Latin America and other regions of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Marcelo? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with the word. First, I will give a, a feedback on the internationalization dimension of 
uh, our activity in particular for our members in a region like our region, the Mediterranean region, obviously we have two, two different approach and I will focus on the Middle East and North Africa in particular. Uh, for sure, uh, it was a big challenge and at the moment a very big problem for um, universities to, to answer to the pandemic situation, in particular looking at the international needs, uh, mobility for instance, but also capacity building. We are trying to maintain our activity, obviously moving on digitalization, everything and so on, but for the university in itself it's quite difficult for them to maintain an eye attention on internationalization with the, the, the lack of uh, capacity that they have in some case, opportunities, and obviously the lack of funding at national level, if you consider that uh, most of them are directly financed by the ministry, they don't have any of their own resources. Um, in addition to that, digitalization in some of the Southern Mediterranean countries was before and the, the COVID was um, not only not, uh, not there, but was not also not possible by law. In some countries, it was forbidden to have some uh, e-learning dimension. You can imagine to move from one day to another immediately from face to face on presence. In universities like, uh, for instance, Cairo University, they have a quarter of a million of students, more than. And this obviously very difficult to move from one day to another to this uh, enlightenment dimension. This, let's say, this impacted on inclusion because obviously in a, in a very fragile society where massification of university, but also where youth society is uh, the majority, 70% more or less and so on, uh, how to combine this with families where they have three, four students mm. per family, where they don't have internet capacity, they don't have laptop at home, and so on. It's very, very difficult. This uh, I, we know that some universities, for instance, they give the opportunity to stu to the students to come to the university just to do online activity because they don't have any facilities at home, and so on. But again, in particular, internationalization is a risk. We are also trying to answer to the question is we are doing a lot of workshops in terms of capacity building and many other issues more than before, thanks to this online dimension and obviously uh, for free. But again, I have to say that this is surely not enough. Uh, we have, I hope that we will be able to come back to soon the normality, but again, I think that is important to be innovative as, as much as possible, to be able to pass this crisis that we are facing. For instance, we worked with virtual exchange, as Rene mentioned for Brazil, we did an important project for three years about virtual exchange in Southern Mediterranean, with 30,000 people participating in our project. This was, start, was launched by European Commission as a pilot project before COVID-19. This was very interesting, luck in a way because we started before and then we in some way our universities our members were used to move the on this online dimension but please don't forget the importance of mutual understanding in a region like our region i mean uh, dialogue among the european countries and the arab world where to meet and to know each other is a fundamental play a fundamental role we can't move only online, we can't answer to this uh, injustice situation in our society, only discussing online, we surely need to improve the mobility. And I have to say, not only south to the north, but also north to the south and south-south, which is another important element. Thank you very much. And before going into the, uh, the grand challenges, the uh the sustainable issues and SDGs, uh, I would just like to add that what you are bringing up, the inequality and uh, also the uh, capacity uh, after the pandemic, uh, it was generally, I think, believed in many countries that we could go online and then that online will be the future. 
but there are more and more uh, experience showing that many students, many pupils are left behind if we go on to the online. And even in a country like Sweden, we do face the same problems with uh, people sharing uh, small apartments, three to four kids in the same. So I think it's important for associations also to stand behind that the government is not just driving us into the online because that will not solve what we ask for, and that is the access and, and equality in higher education. So with this words, I go to the next question, and that is uh, focusing on the grand challenges and um, what role the higher education plays uh, in this uh, addressing, and, and more important is how do you work within the associations with the grand challenges as a very, very strong focus all over the world? So I start with Renee at this time. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, universities across the globe uh, are, are including SDGs or trying to include SDGs as a policy framework for their strategies. Easy to say, hard to do. Uh, universities, uh, first of all, I think that universities must uh, need to start within the institutions, within the university, more widely and deeply within the institutional level of education institutions. For example, having sustainable buildings, day-to-day -day life, uh, certifying process of non-contamination, et cetera, et cetera. It's also important to finance activities related to SDGs, train people on SDGs, students, company leaders, uh, uh, staff, um, professors, include SDGs uh, in programs and curriculum. Um, we have to reform higher education to SDGs. This is the tech challenge to align education, teaching, research, mm -hmm. and outreach to SDGs. Uh, there are, uh, fortunately, we have already a lot of good practice and very good examples of how universities and science engage in climate changes and other aspects of the SDGs. But we have to adapt to change dialoguing with different and new ways of knowledge, knowing through difference, this is very, very important, co-producing knowledge, taking in account social di um, diversity uh, and plurality. And uh, I, I finished this uh, answer um, uh, informing you that the general theme of the fall by to, to 20 to 22 uh, annual conference is known concepts, new meaning. What has changed in the internationalization of higher education? What lessons we have learned? Um, how the future of internationalization of higher education can be project? Those are some questions that we will be discussing and reflecting together uh, next April uh, in Sao Paulo. Thank you. Thank you. Ted? So it's it's interesting. The SDGs uh, as a as a set um, have very little traction among U.S. institutional leaders, uh, and I'm I don't think that that's because we um, don't care about them, but because we we see them uh, through a different lens. We see them through the individual missions of the individual institutions, and so as one goes down the list of SDGs, uh, you really do see a lot of activity among our institutions, but I'm not sure that they would label it as SDG um, uh, activity. So for example, you know, obviously quality education um, is at the core of everything that we all do and everything that our colleagues on the, on the webinar do. Uh, and in the US, I think I've alluded to it, um, our uh, aim is to extend high quality education across the most diverse uh, uh, population we can, and, and some of that includes online with the concerns that we've already talked about. Uh, a lot of it uh, uh, is surrounded by uh, increasing the ability of uh, people to afford higher education through federal, federal grants and aid. Um, it also has to do with the way we work through our Learner Success Lab uh, that I mentioned in the, 
in the chat a while ago um, to encourage institutions to pay attention to research that demonstrates the ways in which uh, colleges and universities can actually promote student learning and student success. And then we talked a moment ago uh, at the beginning about the connection between higher education and work. <clears throat> and that's essential in our mind uh, for addressing uh, SDG number four, SDG number five, uh, three, uh, eight, um, <clears throat> and, and, and probably nine, although I'll get to nine. But in each of those cases, ACE and our institutions are working hard to promote lifelong learning. And that means providing access to not only 18 to 24 year olds who are looking after their secondary education to attain a bachelor's degree, but we're talking as well about single mothers who are returning to the workforce, displaced workers who are looking to retrain, members of the military who are coming back and uh, looking for opportunities. In each of those ways, ACE is promoting the establishment of college credit for the educational experiences that those individuals have had and credit that's aligned with workplace demands so that they are able to easily translate the work they do in our institutions into career advancement and, and, and new jobs. We've been particularly attentive to issues of gender equality uh, across, our, across our campuses, again, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as something that's, that's so critical for us to do uh, in general uh, and um, an important aspect of, of the SDGs. Finally, I do wanna talk about SDG number nine, the industry innovation and infrastructure uh, the U.S., as I, as I think all of you know, uh, made a decision around World War II that, that um, uh, universities would be the hub of uh, science and technology research in, in the U.S. And so we continue to enjoy a strong research partnership with our, with our colleagues in the federal government. And we uh, um, couple that with strong relationships with industry and practice to be able to move our research as quickly as possible uh, into, uh, into appropriate uh, technological advances. The, the COVID-19 vaccine is an example of that, not just in the US, but across the, across the globe as scientists uh, in, in many of our institutions across the world collaborated to really create a breakthrough that was, that was so necessary. Finally, I'll, I'll say one other thing about uh, sustainability, uh, um, environmental sustainability. One of the things that uh, we, we understand in the U.S. is that the footprint of higher education in the United States is large. Um, there are over a million and a half uh, individuals who get their paychecks from institutions of higher education. Uh, and those people, those institutions are significant enterprises. And we believe that higher education can and should lead the way in making those enterprises sustainable and supporters of all of the uh, SDGs. So we're working hard with our institutions to help them develop sustainability policies around their own campuses and their own communities. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uluzli? Yeah, I also believe that universities have important roles to play in the SDGs in their communities. One university should connect to their communities for researches that are relevant to their communities. Uh, governments in their regions will need to take some policies and universities can be in the forefront of for policy evolution based on empirical researches that can be convincing. I also believe that for the promotion of the SDGs, we need to be concerned about the future drivers of the SDGs the product of our institutions. It's very important that we ensure that the graduates coming out from our institutions, they possess the competencies and the skills that are necessary to drive the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Marcelo? Yeah, thank you very much. And again, to talk about the SDGs in a, in a university sector where autonomy is not there, sometimes it's quite difficult. <laughs> how to involve leadership on this discussion. And obviously it's very nice to talk about sustainability is more common sense. Now we tried also to, to give to all our projects SDGs indicator. We are working with FIO 
on this we are and with other uh, other important institutions in the region in a way to try to try to convince the leadership that we have again in Middle East and North Africa we have to play a role on this and the university for sure uh, they they could and they can play a role on this uh, to 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 involve students in a discussion related to SDGs, the importance of SDGs and so on. But again, I think that we have to solve before to, to go more in detail discussing about SDGs in Mediterranean region in Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we have to move from the theoretical dimension to a very concrete uh, dimension. We have to show how important it is through example, through projects or through contamination thanks to other networks that are working worldwide in a very diverse context and to try to convince not only the leadership, which is obviously important, but more important, I think, that is the researchers to convince them from to cooperate on a different scale on this. You know that in most of our education institutions in Middle East and North Africa, they are more uh, devoted to education than research, unfortunately. This is something that obviously is another challenge for the region to improve research dimension. And that is normally uh, under the, the control of under organization organized by the, the government and so on. Uh, if we are able, and this is something that I say for our network, for UNIMED, if we are able to uh, improve the capacity of our universities to move forward, to, 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 to go in the direction to improve research dimension through capacity building actions and so on. I think that we will serve our community better and better, and for sure we will be able to improve the discussion on SDGs. There is a huge interest from other institutions, I mentioned FIO, but not only. To, to encourage this participation of universities and to read from the region on, on this issue. But again, unfortunately, there are many, many other priorities. And I think that this discussion is still far from uh, our region. And for sure, it could be interesting to, to discuss among us to try to address some, uh, some potential answer to this priority. Thank you very much. Before going to the, I bring the two last questions together because time is running, but I would like to give some comments on the SDGs. I think what you are saying, Marcelo, it's, 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 there is a resistance. Even in Sweden, you saw this is not academic freedom and you should not. And, and I would say that, that the, the important thing, and I think you raised this, Ted, is that this is a mindset of the people, of the researchers, of the students to take responsibility for the future, for the society, and not only where you live, but also on a global level. And I was talking to school rectors for a while ago, and they were very resistant to, to, to bring in SDGs in the schools. But when we talked about this, that this is a mindset that you in all in all research and also in all education always have in mind that you have to look in broader context of what you're doing. And I think, as you said, Ted, also the 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 um, stakeholders, the societal stakeholders will ask more and more for this. And that includes also the industry. So that was my comment. And finally, I would like you to shortly uh, comment on uh, how you engage globally and uh, you, how you see your collaboration among your members globally. And also, what do you do to advocate? Because we know all that it's important to advocate for the um, policymakers to the governments, because uh, the issue you raised in the beginning, funding, is very important. We need public funding for, for having an equality, higher education, both in research and, and in education. So would you like to start, Ted? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, being involved uh, in forums like IAU is an essential element of our engagement uh, in global higher education issues. And we're very, very grateful to be able to be a part of uh, these discussions. And, and uh, whether they are in groups or bilaterally, uh, we, we always learn and we, 
we undertake to learn in everything that we do. Uh, the U.S. perspective is a is an odd one, and you know I I mentioned at the beginning that we're the umbrella organization for U.S. higher education. Uh, it, it, it we are often called on to represent the voice of U.S. higher education, and that's very difficult in a very decentralized system. I think that I could probably find you an institution that represents any particular point of view at any moment in time across the U.S. spectrum, but we try to work hard to um, aggregate all of those different perspectives and create some understanding of the key issues facing our, facing our institutions. Um, in addition to doing that, and, and I think centrally learning from all the rest of you, uh, we work hard on the issue of internationalization. Uh, Robin Helms, who's on the webinar today, guides our international efforts, and among them is a, 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 a a professional development opportunity for our institutions in the area of internationalization. And it's a high, high priority for us because we believe that it's essential for US students to be citizens of the world. And uh, so we, we work hard there. Um, in addition to that, we've done uh, joint programs, virtual exchanges, uh, partnering with other agencies, research collaborations, and policy. And as we talk about policy, I think it's important to understand that we're in an era in which research uh, is becoming more and more politicized, and we're very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. We're quite concerned that um, uh, the search for new knowledge, the search for knowledge that can be applied to real world problems is not uh, anybody's domestic responsibility. It really is the responsibility of uh, global higher education. And so we want to make sure that the barriers to collaboration, the barriers to the open exchange of ideas are low and that we continue to build policy frameworks in which our scholars and our researchers, our teachers and our students uh, can work together. So um, uh, th that briefly summarizes where we are on our international uh, work. And uh, we, we hope to continue our work with um, all of our colleagues who are on the webinar today. Thank you very much. Uluzuli, you raised your yeah, hand. I will, thank you very much. I will say that global engagement is a priority in our activities. We are happy to collaborate with various organizations all over the world. And we are interested, we are happy to also collaborate with uh, fellow uh, university associations like us. Beyond this, we promote institutional networking through joint programs and research collaborations. One very important global engagement activity that we are involved with is the promotion of diaspora involvement in African university activities. We believe that there are many Africans in the diaspora and their involvement in, their, in the institutions in Africa has been found to add great value to our university system. Lastly, I will say that we are open to conference participation where we're able to share ideas and learn from other people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. Uh, yes. Um, well, the oldest experience of, of FAUBAI uh, is engagement with other associations. And I would, uh, uh, because we don't have so many time, I would uh, just uh, talk about this uh, experience, this very, very important one. Um, and Faubai ha ha has been participating uh, in the last 20 years, is the Network of International Education Associations, NIEA, mm -hmm. which currently brings together 15 international education associations in the world, including for sure, and certainly IAU. Uh, it's really a very, very important and active network. In July uh, 2020, the NIE launched an important joint declaration about the importance of internationalization of higher education and research aimed at governments and higher education institutions leaders which reaffirms the importance of internationalization of higher education for a more sustainable and better future for all. I would um, like to strongly invite you all to know and to disseminate uh, this important declaration, which is available for 
show uh, at uh, the EAU, EAU uh, website as well as uh, on the FAUBAI website. Uh, in our website, it's available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Thank you. And also, and also to, to, to finish my participation, we have to promote more horizontal cooperation. South, 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 yes. south, north. Um, we have to think bold, new, critically, and take care as well, uh, at the same time, of traditional roles of higher education. Um, as you uh, all might know, uh, Brazil is going through a very special and difficult moment. Current government is negationist, anti-science, anti-university. But the country, and this is very, very important to emphasize, is much bigger than the government. Better days will come. Brazilian universities resist. Brazilian science and university have great role and preeminence. Uh, and uh, more than ever, higher education is important. We must act more and better together. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for this message and also the optimism. We need that. And Marcelo, finally, your comments, yeah. please. Yeah, it's very difficult to say something after this Rene statement on Brazil. <laughs> and uh, we, we obviously, we, we take care about the situation. We stay with you and we continue to support our Brazilian friends for sure. And also we know how Brazilian are uh, independent by the government. And uh, if I may, uh, we were so, before the, the COVID, we were so discussing about the impact of globalization in our society. Then the COVID arrived and we understood how global we are, more than we were considering. And the, the, the impact was, for all of us, uh, extremely very hard. And uh, I think that it's now time to in particular for, again, for a region that where I work, to open the door to, to, to contamination with other, with other uh, higher education system. We have to skip this Euro-Mediterranean dialogue and we will have to move around the world. I think that UNIMED and its member have to dialogue with African universities, with American universities, with Asian universities more and more because we are in a global society. We have to also give, uh, because you know this discussion is also um, affected by this um, nationalist movement and uh, that we have in Europe against uh, migration and many other issues that you also in US, you, uh, you have probably have been also touched during Trump uh, presidency and so on. And I think that the best way to, to overcome all this problem and to pass up this problem is again to open the door to a more global dimension in this sense I think that your role like AIU is extremely important and fundamental and I can ask you to continue with this uh, organization of activities like this but more and more with our members directly uh, that are actually more interesting to listen to me but uh, inviting the Arab world, the Mediterranean society, to look to other region and to consider that they are not, uh, as they are used to say, I'm Sicilian, I'm totally Mediterranean, and I can say that, but we are uh, the, the, the center of the world. We have to uh, look to other, to others' experiences, and for sure, by contaminating each other, we will be able at least to better understand uh, each other. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity. Thank you very much to all. Time is running very quickly. And uh, I would like, before leave, uh, leaving the floor to Hillage, I don't know if there are questions, but uh, what we all, and what you have presented and what you have said, I see that there, uh, there is um, an agreement and we do see the imp importance of cooperating also among association. I think that we can take different roles 
for our members and between each other when it comes to promoting and advocating for higher education. Institutions have their own uh, network also, and, and they work together, but we can promote them in different regions and in different uh, uh, perspectives. So I'm really happy for this discussion. And uh, as the president for IAU, I'm very happy to, to take a global responsibility and that we share because we, if we can collect on the global level, we can also share with you on regional uh, associate on as uh, regional associations a global perspective which you can bring back to policymakers and to your institutions. So with these words, I thank you and I leave the floor to Hillage to end up. Well, I have exactly one minute, <laughs> but I would like to certainly, there's not much I would uh, need to add to these uh, wise words and the very uh, good presentations that you all made. Uh, I would like to thank you for your contributions, for your time as well, uh, for sharing all this very valuable information. We saw it in the chat. People really appreciated it a lot. They learned a lot. I think these discussions, as all of you said, are key to better understanding and building a different kind of bridges between our uh, different uh, organizations, associations, diff between the work that we all do. Uh, we can leverage on our um, associations' capacities individually, but we can certainly do much more all together. So where you said, Pam, we can provide for a global perspective, we really value your regional perspectives uh, to back to the, the global level, because people want to know from your end exactly what is happening in your institutions, uh, what is happening in your organizations, and how uh, together we can uh, create the space for higher education to be trusted even better because the word of trust needs to be put on the table on and on again. Trust in the system, trust in the way that universities can uh, be part of the solution to the challenges that we face uh, and better um, so uh, in the future as well. And we've heard about the many challenges we also all face on our different uh, sides of, of, of our uh, desks. But uh, we, we certainly uh, need to um, grow this capacity for all of us to uh, exchange even better. So thank you very much. I want to, to reiterate the, the idea that this conversation is a, is a conversation starter for a future and better cooperation, even beyond uh, the, the, the limits of our current cooperation into the future. This webinar will also feed into the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference as one of the conversations that uh, will inform uh, the, the discussions around what future for higher education. Uh, and we hope that uh, uh, it will have um, a very uh, large sounding board at the, at the UNESCO conference, but way beyond. We make this um, webinar uh, available to everyone. I want to thank uh, the co-hosts and the association um, of, um, of, of uh, higher education in the United States for this joint initiative, the Association of African Universities, UNIMED, FAUBAI, for, uh, for all the, the views shared. Um, and we hope that you will make it available on your websites likewise, so that uh, many more people maybe can benefit from this exchange and maybe also suggest new topics, either for your own organizations to, to tackle through this kind of, uh, of setting or for the uh, global association to pick up on uh, as well in the future. So we, in complement to the conversations that we have uh, online in this uh, format, the webinars, we also issued a call for papers on the future of higher education, the future of, of cooperation. So if you're interested to contribute a paper, please go to the IU website. You'll find uh, the call for papers easily. These are kind of teasers, small papers, um, and not requiring a lot of time. We know that everybody's very busy. Yet um, these 800 some words that you can share there can lead to further work. So you can, you can uh, inform the readers about other opportunities for reading uh, beyond the limits of set for the, for the IU horizons. And that issue uh, of our magazine will also be sent to all the participants at the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference. So to have as many views in that issue will be very much uh, valued as well. 
So thank you very much. I went way beyond my one minute. Thank you for your participation and looking forward to uh, next steps together. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you. Thanks bye. a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Keep safe. Keep safe, certainly. Keep safe. And enjoy your holidays, Renee. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.